Welcome to Last First Date Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. This is episode number 425 with Ken Bechtel, How to Manifest Lasting Love. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late for love and that a woman of value naturally attracts the respect and rewards she deserves in life and love. And speaking of women of value, my new book is now available on Amazon Kindle and paperback, and it's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And if you're watching on video, you can see a copy here in front of my face. (laughs) The book is filled with personal and client stories, expert interviews like the one I'm having with Ken today. And I think Ken actually is in the book. You are, Ken. I am. (laughs) You are. Our interview is in the book. Yeah, I'll have to, we'll have to reference that later. And there are 30 tips in the book and exercises for stepping more fully into your values. So head on over after the show to get a copy of Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. This week's tip comes from the book and it's called uh, Communicate Clearly and Graciously. Communication is really It's everything, as most of you already know. If you struggle with communication, you struggle with relationships. And when we don't really do the work, we're not communicating clearly. We're we're doing it with passive aggression. With uh, we're not really saying what we want to say, but we're saying it with a smile when we're really mad. And uh, so, when you learn the tools, the skills to communicate clearly and graciously, you will become one step closer to being a woman of value who is valued for for what she has to say. And this goes for men too, but don't tell anybody. (laughs) Um, And so before I bring on Ken, I just want to give a shout out to my fantastic Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And it is for women over 40 who are looking for a positive place to go, for support, not for venting, not for bashing, not for complaining nonstop because that's what most groups on Facebook do, unfortunately. We are a guided group where we have specific guidelines so that we can really move forward in a positive way. So I hope you join us over there at your last first date. And now for Ken, he is back. (laughs) He is a spiritual teacher, a minister, and a love mentor. He has been leading programs on how to build a solid foundation for love and to create healthy partnerships that last. And he's been doing this for over 20 years. He specializes in helping women blossom into the best version of themselves so they attract the type of partner that loves them completely inside and out. Welcome to the show again, Ken. (laughs) Hi, Sandy. Great to be back here. Yeah, the last time we spoke about understanding men, and now we're talking about how to manifest lasting love. So understanding men is a big part of it, and that's the part mm-hmm. that's in the book. But um, like, what, why, why the focus on manifesting love, lasting love? Well, you know, if you think about it culturally, we got some problems with this area, right? I mean, there's lots of people get married and half of them get divorced. And then you get to a second marriage and something like 60% get divorced. You get to a third marriage and like 75% get divorced. So clearly something's missing on the lasting part. Right? That's the part that's missing. <laughs> so we're getting the, the hit of, oh, this person cares about me. This person supports me. This person loves me. But we've never been trained in how to maintain it. How do you make sure that lasts? Because we all grow and evolve as we go through life. That's normal. All kinds of things happen. You have kids, the kids go away, you have a career, maybe you have a second career. There's all these different things that happen, not to mention health issues and everything else. So it has to keep evolving. And unfortunately, very few people have ever been trained in how to maintain lasting love. Good answer. Yeah, I mean, and you bring up a good point about the evolution of a relationship. And I think a lot of people think you just get in it and kind of like a crock pot, you fix it and forget <laughs> it, right? <laughs> but if you forget it, it usually forgets you. So we have to really learn the tools, the keys to 
how to make it last. Most of us didn't grow up in homes where it was modeled for us and we didn't learn it in school. And so that's why we do what we do. So um, a lot of people feel that um, to, well, to find lasting love, they have to be in a relationship. And you say that getting into a relationship is not the key. So tell us what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, and the reason I say that is it's really about if we look at what relationship means, right? So that's the normal thing. Oh, you're looking for a relationship, you're in a relationship. We use that language all the time. But if you think about what it actually means, what does relationship mean? Relationship is literally, the definition of relationship is how two people relate or behave toward each other. That's all it is. And there's all kinds of relationships, right? You've got the, like, if you're a tenant, you've got a landlord relationship. If you're an employee, you have an employer relationship. And so we, same thing happens in romantic relationships. The problem is these are spatial. These are physical engagements. That's what a relationship is. It's based on being in proximity, interactions in the physical level. But what happens is what we really want is a partnership. Because a partnership is actually where you have shared investment and shared rewards, where you're working as a team, you have an agreement. This is a soul level connection. It's not just on the surface. Because think about it, in relationships, how many times have you out there, maybe it was you, Sandy, maybe it's other people listening, they're had a great weekend, spent all this time with their, with their boyfriend or girlfriend, they're having a great time. That person goes home and all of a sudden they're like, I don't know, did, did something go wrong? What happened? I don't know. I don't feel connected because it was so spatial. They're gone and now you're worried about it. But if you're in a partnership, you have an agreement that you're working together. So even when they're away, you don't get freaked out. It's just like if you had a business partnership, right? So you got a business partnership and your business partner goes home from work. You don't freak out and go, are we still in a business partnership? No, because you have an agreement. You're actually partners, you're teammates, you're working towards a mutual goal. And that's the difference is we think we want a relationship. So a way you can visually think of this, a relationship is like a chair. So, you know, if you wanted to sit down, you'd go look for a chair, right? So what's the relationship? Like most of you probably watching this or listening to this or sitting in a chair. What are you giving to the chair? Your butt. <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot, right? I had one person say, I'm holding it down. And I'm like, no, I don't think it's going anywhere if you're not there. <laughs> I'm like, we got gravity for that. But what's happening is it's one way, right? The chair is doing all the work. It's supporting you. It's allowing you to relax and be your best self and, and recuperate. Now, what happens? That person gets up out of the chair. Do they turn around and say, what can I do for you? No, that's not what that is. So relationship is one-sided. Unfortunately, this is what most people are operating in. A one-sided relationship where you've been taught, and this is especially true for women, but guys do it too. If you give and give and give and give and give, eventually they'll turn around and give back. But if you're a chair, nobody turns around and does something for the chair after you get out of it. Now, a partnership is more like a teeter-totter, right? Because you can't, Enjoy a teeter-totter by yourself. Both of you have to be equally engaged. It's a back and forth, a give and take. Each one's lifting each other up as needed. And because you're doing that, you're fully engaged. It is a partnership. It is an agreement that we're going to participate in this together. So when I've asked people for years and years now, I'm like, well, which do you want, a relationship or partnership? Nobody has ever asked for a, partner or a relationship after that. But we've never been explained what's the difference. So that's why I talk about it's not going to lead to lasting love because it's one-sided. You can only give for so long. And eventually you're going to get resentful. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to feel like they don't care. They're not doing any work. And it won't be viable. Now, trust me, people are amazing in how long they can hold their breath. How long they can be that chair. I had a woman the other day that told me literally she'd been married 25 years. And her mantra was, I can live with that. Every time she wasn't getting her needs fulfilled, every time she was giving and giving and not getting anything back, even to the point where her husband had an affair. And she said, I literally said out loud, well, as long as it ends, I can live with that. The only thing that got her out of that marriage was it happened again. But that's how much we lean on that. And we're like, but 
it's working. It's not working. It's one-sided. So that's why it doesn't last. Even though you may stay in the physical relationship, the love's gone. Yeah. I've, I've known people who've had multiple, their partners had multiple affairs and they just keep, they actually get angry at the person their husband's having an affair with instead of the person who they should be upset with. And yeah, and it's, it's just fascinating what people do. I got an email from a woman just over the weekend and I created a video for her just about this exact thing. She's young. She's calling herself in love with someone she really doesn't know very well. And she's asking me how she can make him love her, how she can make him forget his past because he's scared to be in a relationship with her because the last woman dumped him and <laughs> because he couldn't commit to marriage, but she's going to make him love her. And I was like, no, that's not your job, you know, and it will never work. And it's, it's, it's a bigger, it's a bigger discussion, but it's, it's, yeah. And a lot of people get stuck there. So what do you say to someone like who? is stuck in that pattern of I, I can make them change or I can tolerate that. There's kind of both things happening here. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing is, well, it's twofold actually. One is we have no control over how somebody else interacts with us. And the sooner we own that and know that I can't change how they're going to respond to me, they get to choose that every time. Now I can change how I think they responded, what that meant, but I can't change how they respond to me. So if we instead focus on being our best self and just taking care of the thing we can control, and then they get to opt in or opt out. And trust me, it's way better to find out fast that they're not opting in. If they don't want to be your partner, find out as fast as you can, because otherwise you're going to be invested and you're going to try and make it work because you put this time and energy into it and you don't want to waste all that time, and you're scared to go back out there, because what if you do it again? So it's really about the inside part. It's, it's, it's one of the disconnects in a lot of the you know, dating advice that's out there, which is all this external strategies and techniques and approaches and how to look and how to smile and all that kind of stuff. But what happens is that's all outside, and you bloom from the inside. Remember, Sandy, you mentioned that I, I help people blossom into their best selves. It's just like you're a flower. If you were a rose, for example, well, guess what? You have to get your needs met in order for you to blossom. Now, if you don't get enough water, let's say, you won't die, but you won't bloom. And a rose bush that isn't blooming isn't all that interesting. It's just a thorny green plant. It's not that great. It's the bloom that's essential. So you've got to be committed to your blossom. When you bloom, yeah, some people don't like that rose. That's okay. All you care about is the ones that do but you won't give the ones that love that rose an opportunity to love you if they can't see the blossom. Because as far as they know, you're the same as every other rose when you're just the, maybe you've got a little bud and you get the promise of blossoming, but you're not there or you don't have any of that and you're just a thorny green bush. Either way, that's not gonna work. So we've gotta go inside and do the work on who we are, making sure our needs get met so we can blossom. Then you can find that person that's like, wow, that's amazing. I want to make sure that rose keeps blooming for the rest of time. That's your partner. You're all full of metaphors and analogies today, Ken. I am. I, am. <laughs> I love them. And the thing about the thorny green bush, too, is that the thorns are very evident. And, you know, you see the guardedness, the, the fact that you just like, don't touch, don't come closer. And People don't even realize what they're giving off, that, that energy that's coming off of them. Because there's so much beauty and amazingness inside, but if you're covering it up with the thorns and the, you know, that, that lack of flower, mm -hmm. nobody sees it, nobody appreciates it, and you often will form the wrong conclusions. Like, I'm not capable of love, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm too that, and the truth is, it's none of those things, right? It's, it's not yeah. accessing that inner flower inside you. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the thing that we have to remember, if you think of a rose again, right? Every rose has thorns. It's not like you have to have no thorns. We all have wounds, we all have pain, we all have those things. But think about it. When a rose blossoms, do you pay attention to the thorns anymore? 
No, they're inconsequential then. Every one of us has grabbed a rose once and got our finger pricked. Did we throw the rose in the ground and stomp on it? No, we're like, it's worth it. It's worth it because that rose is so magnificent. So that's where your energy goes. And the other things, we all have them. They won't matter. The rose is worth it. And that's what you have to remember. Yeah, and I'll say <laughs> even one, one other thing that I thought of as you're talking is that those thorns are actually what helps make the rose more beautiful. And we have to have that contrast of our wounds and, and also it makes us relatable. If, if we only show up as this perfect, gorgeous rose, then we are not really relatable. And I think a lot of people go to that extreme where it all has to look perfect and it's, that's not the goal. Yeah. Um, so, so if you can share with us some ways to start, like how do, how do they do the inner work? Like what would, you, what would you do with somebody who comes to you and is stuck in this pattern of not healthy relationships, of really keeping the thorns up and, you know, how do, how do, they, how do they start? Well, the first thing is, you know, most people, if they can relate to being a chair, that means they're a giver right? They're that pleaser that I always put everybody else's needs first. And that's what is having your rose start. You're not getting your, your needs met. Now, I work with thousands of women and most of you, and this is not a judgment, this is just a reality. Because you're focused on others' needs, you've forgotten about your own. You've never even thought about what you need. And so that's where you've got to start. You've got to identify. It's kind of like, here I go with another analogy. <laughs> It's like if you were at the the, um, the garden shop, right, the garden store, and you're looking to buy a plant for your house. Well, what do they have? Those, those little hang tags that say, this rose or this flower needs, you know, moderate light and lots of water and da 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 So you can tell, oh, will this work in my bathroom? No, I don't have any direct sunlight. Can't put it in the bathroom. I need a plant for the bathroom, not the right plant. Now somebody knows, are you something I can support? Right, so you've got to know your needs and own them for yourself so that somebody else is like, oh, that's the perfect match. Or I don't have what that particular plant needs. And they can move on, but you got to start with your own needs. If you don't know what your needs are, well, nobody else is going to know what they are. And you'll be back in that same place of not being able to blossom. Because you're not blossoming for somebody else. You're blossoming because it's who you are, just like a regular rose in the, you know, in the garden. It doesn't blossom for you. It blossoms because that's what it does. That's its gift. Same thing. We're not doing it for someone else. We're going, I'm committed to blossoming, period. Whatever it takes. And am I going to invite somebody in if they're interested? Absolutely. But it's not, I only blossom for them. You're blossoming for you. That's a good one. So yes, we need to blossom for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But let's get more concrete. So what are some of the core needs that people have dismissed, put aside, suppressed for others? What are, what are some ways that people can start to access these, these key core needs? The key thing is it's, it's, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> so people think needs and they think he needs to you know, spend more time with me. He need, I need a guy who communicates more often. I need a guy who whatever. That's what they think are their needs. It's never about them. So let's use spend more time with me. It's not about spending more time. It's about what you feel when he spends more time with you. So the thing that's missing is we've disconnected from our feelings. Because obviously, if you feel like you're not important, you're not a priority, he doesn't really care about you, that's not fun. So what do you do? You turn those off. You numb yourself. So you've got to reconnect with those feelings. And that's the perfect question. Okay, I'm looking for a man who's, let's say, punctual. I hated it. My last guy was always late, it drove me nuts. He never called. I never knew if he was hurt or what was going on. He needs to be punctual. That's not your need. Your need is what does punctual provide? So maybe punctual provides feeling of respect, feeling that, you know, you are a priority, that they want you to know how they're doing, that they care about you so that you're not stressed out thinking maybe they got in an accident. It's the feeling, it's what it provides is what your need is. It can take any kind of form, right? Because we've all been with people who were like, wow, they're not my type, but I have so much fun with them. It wasn't about 
their form, were they this, you know, tall, skinny, I was actually talking to a woman this weekend. She goes, you know, I, I met this amazing guy and we have so much fun. And like, I feel connected to him in ways I never thought was ever going to be possible. Like he sees me and understands me in ways I never, ever experienced. I was just kind of resigned to nobody will ever get that part of me. And he does. And she goes, and the weird part is he's not my type. <laughs> and I'm like, who cares? And she's, but she even said that. She goes, it was weird because at first I literally was looking at, well, you know, I like guys like this and he's not bad. There probably won't be anything here. She goes, and I almost shut the door. But then I gave it a shot. In her case, it was a friend that had introduced them. So, you know, for a friend's sake, she wanted to give it a shot. And so she was open to it. And now she's like, why was I even looking at that? Who cares? What really matters is I feel amazing. I feel seen and understood and appreciated. And that's the key. We got to let go of the forms and focus on the feelings. I love that because we get so tripped up in it has to look this way. Yep. And uh, love almost always comes in a surprise package. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and your type doesn't work because it hasn't worked for you before. So why would it work now? <laughs> yep. um, so, so that's a major block for people. Like, yeah. would you say that one of the things that gets in the way of looking for love is that we look for a list mm -hmm. and it, it blocks us from the feeling of what we're going to feel like? Um, and, um, so let's talk about first dates and, um, a lot of people sabotage first dates and they do it unknowingly. So what are your thoughts about how women do sabotage their first dates? Well, what I've witnessed is that the biggest thing is women go on first dates trying to play it safe. And what I mean by safe is satisfied, avoiding failure every time. I just don't want to screw this up. I want to make sure this, I get the second date. I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And so you're focusing on being the lowest version of you. Low vibration, worry, fear, scarcity. There's only a few good guys out there, so I better not mess this up. As opposed to being you. And so when you're playing it safe, that's not interesting to a high, you know, high quality guy. He's not looking for low vibration. He's looking for somebody who's shiny and bright and, and showing up. And I mean, you can go through all the steps, right? I'm a great conversationalist. I smile and I was nice. I was fun. I was funny. And I, I you know, appreciated his world and I listened really well. And you do all the things they've told you to do on the outside. But if inside you're still trying to play it safe because you don't want him to know anything more about you and, and you're afraid that if you open up because you like this guy that you'll get hurt, the vibration drops and he's like, oh, she was nice but he doesn't call you that. Kiss of death on a first date is a nice first date. He's nice. Oh, he's a nice guy. We had a nice time. Total train wreck. Because you don't call nice back. Nice is everywhere. You've got to get somebody's attention. How do you do it? You bring that rose. Oh my God. So instead of playing it safe, which I know most of you probably never thought of it that way, but that's what you're doing, I invite you to date safer. So safer is where, how do I describe it? Well, first of all, you're not doing it for him. Safe is where you're thinking, I gotta do these things so that he'll like that. When you're dating safer, you're doing it for you. So safer stands for self-confident, authentic, fun, excited, and receptive. So the self-confident and authentic, they kind of go together. Right? This is you bringing that rose, you being your best self. I'm here for me. I'm gonna to speak to my needs. We walked into the restaurant. It's, it's a cold night out. They offer us a table right by the door. I'm aware I'll get cold because they're gonna keep opening the door. I speak to my need. I have that confidence. I can say, you know what? I actually don't want, I think it's gonna be cold here. Can we wait for another table? That's self-confident. You didn't do it for him. You did it for you. So you weren't compromised from the second you sat down and everybody kept opening the door and the whole time you're distracted. Oh, no, the door's open. I got to brace myself. Oh no, I don't want to put the shawl on because I'll look like I'm cold, but I'm really cold and I don't know how to play this off. We've all done it, right? So that's the first two. Now, the fun part is, <laughs> this, this part cracks me up. We tend to kind of hide if we're having fun. 
because we don't want them to think we're like a pushover, right? So we try and play cool. Yeah, hey, this is nice. And we don't want to show them too much excitement or too much fun. So the fun and excitement are where you're actually being honest about that, right? Because I'll tell you this right now, if a man takes you out and he's like, you know, you had a good time, whatever, he goes home and he evaluates that and maybe you had a nice time, but you were holding it back, you're trying to play it cool, you didn't want to look too excited. He's not going to ask you out again because he's going to think, I don't think she really liked me. Why would he want to get turned down, right? Because you've got to remember, every time a man asks you out, it doesn't matter if it's a first date, second date, 40th date, he risks being rejected every single time. So if you don't give him some indicators that, this is a pretty good chance it's not going to get rejected. He's very likely not going to go down that path because he's looking for the person that is fun to be with, is excited to be together. And then the last thing is the receptivity. And again, this is one of those things that, that has been trained for years and years and years and generations passed down the idea that, oh, well, if a man does something for you, there's a string attached. He's, he's, he's got a motive. Now, yes, are there the guys that think if he buys you a drink, he, gets to sleep with you, yeah, there's some of those, but that's the exception as opposed to the norm. And if you're attracting that over and over again, it's because that's your belief. That's what you're looking for, subconsciously. But here's the thing, if you're receptive, even if he doesn't do a great job, like maybe he took you out to a place and it wasn't your favorite restaurant, but it was still nice and a good gesture and he was friendly, be appreciative of what's there. Be receptive to that. He offers to walk you to your car. Be receptive to that. He offers to, you know, whatever, pull out your chair, get your coat. Receptivity is key because men are compelled. We're wired to try and contribute to your happiness. So if we keep offering and you keep saying, no, I got it. No, I'm fine. No, that's good. He's going to figure he can't make you happy. And here's the key. Men marry women who they are convinced they can make happy. And we leave women we're convinced we can't. So if you play it, Oh, no, I got it. I got it. I'm good because I don't want you to think that, that I owe you something. You're not going to get a second date from a quality guy. It's that simple. So it's dating safer instead of safe. And that's the real key. Interesting. So safer and it stands for self-confident, authentic, fun, excited, and receptive. Yep. That's great. I love it. And so uh, what if she's not excited? <laughs> she meets, you know, goes on a lot of dates and um, here, I mean, so yeah, there, there are times when you meet somebody who's not a good fit, but Absolutely. what I see happen often is women will go on a date already jaded, already feeling like, oh my God, I've been on so many bad dates and here's another one. It's probably not going to work. Um, is there a way that you can suggest that women kind of bring a little bit of a different approach to the date so that she's not bringing all this negative energy, the thorn, the thorny bush? Yeah, and that's a great point because you're right. If you go out on a date with this idea of, oh, it's probably a waste of time, guess what? <laughs> it's going to be a waste of time because he's going to pick up on that. He's going to tell you don't really care if you're there, you're going through the motions, fine, fine. Men are not as obtuse as you'd like to think they are. We just don't have the language for it. So men, most, most men wouldn't say, oh, your energy was weird. We don't know that language. So men are just like, I don't know, wasn't that much fun. Because it was a disconnect. The energy wasn't there. So first thing is, and this goes back to the fun part. If you're not looking forward to having fun on that date, don't go for you or for him. Just be honest. Self-confident hey, you know what? I'm really not feeling up to it. Can I contact you later if I feel like getting together? Instead of having him continue to contact you a thousand times and the whole time you really aren't interested. And if you really aren't interested, tell him. Here's something I want every woman listening to this to hear. You can never be too direct with a man as long as you're coming from love. Men like direct. It's like, you know, when you take a Band-Aid off, men are like, rip it off fast, it'll sting for a second, and then it's over. 
if you give him some vague thing like not right now and then wonder why he called you because he's trying to find out when right now is you just told him there's a future you think you didn't but you did because you wanted to soften it you didn't want to tell him the truth so if you're not interested in the date or you're feeling jaded you need to take some time out and decide what matters to you most of the time we feel jaded because we don't know what we're looking for it's kind of like here I go again. <laughs> it's like <laughs> if you've ever gotten really hungry, right? And so you go to the grocery store and you're walking around the grocery store and you're looking everywhere and you're like, no, there's nothing here I want to eat. It's a room full of food, <laughs> but you still can't find what will satisfy you because you don't know what you're looking for. So you literally will say there's nobody here. That's why women are always, there's no good guys. But well, what are you looking for? I don't know. Well, that's why you can't find it. It's just like going to the grocery store with no idea what you want. It will feel like there's nothing there. So if you're feeling jaded, and you're, chances are you haven't been putting out any intention of what you're looking for. And you just dated any guy that said yes, or maybe you dated every third guy that looked cute, whatever your criteria was, but it wasn't aligned with what you're really looking for. So you've got to get clarity around that. So now you know, oh, this guy fits some criteria. Oh. He's not my type, he's not this, but it, I really liked his profile. I'll give it a shot. I'm gonna have fun learning. Not, this is it. If you go into a first date, this better be it. It will never be your last first date. Yeah. Because that pressure is palpable. Yeah. It's like a, you're putting up a wall going, I dare you. I dare you to be that guy because if you're not it, you're gonna be it. Huge yeah, disappointment. You better, you better prove to me that yeah. you, you're never going to make me sit, feel bad. Right. Well, that's you'll impossible. never hurt me. <laughs> you'll never cheat on me. You'll never hurt me. And uh, yeah, and then people want to know, is the sex going to be good? Tell me on the first date because otherwise I'm going to waste my time with you. And you're talking about the grocery store, which is another great metaphor. And I'm thinking of my daughter who moved back home during uh, the pandemic. Oh. And... Um, she opens the fridge often and says there's nothing to eat and the fridge is full of food. And so the, the interesting thing about that, and I never really thought about that in terms of dating and relationships, but we often again go in with just one idea, one form that it can take. It has to be ready-made, it has to be Chinese food, it has to be sushi, it has to look like something I already know and I know I like. Mm -hmm. And what if you could be creative? What if you could go into that fridge and say, well, let's see, we have some eggs, we have this, we have that, we could put it all together, we can make a cake, we could make a quiche, we can make all these amazing things with what's already in the fridge. But if you're coming in with like this narrow vision of it's not here, I don't see it, so we, it doesn't exist. That's, that's it's a great metaphor. I mean, I, I love the idea of the food because I think everyone can relate to that. To, yeah. You know? Yeah. I had a, a, a client of mine once that she called me and she's like, Oh, you're going to be so excited. I went out with this guy the other day and he was 5'11. And in her mind, they had to be six foot or taller. And I said, oh, Did God. you measure him? Like, how the hell did you know this? <laughs> and the funny part is, she's 5'2. Oh, no. So it's not because she's tall. And I said, You got to quit worrying about the measuring tape and figure out what that idea. What, what's the feeling that it emanates in you? Because yeah. then if you meet a guy and he's 5'8", and you feel that way, you don't care how tall he is. You're focused yeah. on the feeling. But yeah, it was hilarious, because I'm like, so <laughs> did you literally like, oh, he's 5'11", what's the point, why am I here? Like, why did you go <laughs> if he was 5'11", and you were already thinking, oh my God, this is such a big step? Because you, you still weren't focused on the feeling. If you cared what his height was, you weren't focused on the feeling. Yeah, I see the same thing with education. education Gotta have a PhD. And it, yeah, and it's it looks a certain way. And so what is that? What's important about that to you? It always comes back to how does it make you feel? How do you want to feel with a person who's who you're dating in terms of intelligence? Yep. And, you know, and I always say to women, how, how many men have you met? How many people with PhDs have you met who are really not very intelligent you know it doesn't prove anything to be a doctor a lawyer uh, you know have a phd it's it really is not about the piece of paper it's about who you are as a person yeah people get very caught up um 
something else you said that I was going to ask you about, and then I have one more question. Now, of course, I forgot. Um, okay, so if they're coming in and they're dated, we have, we have, we have something they can do is just to mm -hmm. be more authentic. Oh, yeah, the question I had for you, because you said, you know, men like direct, yeah. they, you know, just to let them know. So for all those women who have been direct and men have been abusive, to them for their direct response to, you know what, I don't, I don't see it as much. I, you know, you seem like a nice guy, but I don't see it going forward. It's happened to me many times because I'm a direct person. And recently I spoke to a man who, after a very short conversation on the phone, it was really clear to me we were not a good match at all. And, um, and I told him at the end, I said, you know, you seem lovely and I just don't feel we're on the same page and I, I want to wish you the best of luck, but I'm not going to move forward. And he got really quiet and said, okay. And then sent me the most abusive series of texts about how it's women like me who destroyed his life in college and he's not going to date anymore because it's just not safe. And so, I mean, a lot of people would take that to heart. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who have been direct and been been abused for it. Yeah, and there's there's this is a great question because you're right that that does happen and it happens more and more in the online world because frequency goes through the roof, right? <laughs> you could get rejected 20 times in one day. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it could Yay! be pretty brutal, right? <laughs> so, and most people aren't very kind because they're online they figure whatever i don't have to this isn't really me you know it's the same way people post things they would never say to your face and they'll put it on online so the biggest thing is appreciate what he's already done like i said men risk being rejected every time they ask you out every time so appreciate hey i really appreciate that's not easy to ask somebody out and i'm flattered Thank you very much. And I got to be honest, this, this doesn't, it doesn't seem like a match, whatever reasoning you have. And, you know, then you just go from there. You say, this is where it's at. I'm not interested. I don't, don't make up some story. He'll know you're telling him a line. Tell him the truth. Tell him, hey, I'm not, and if he goes off, be like, God bless him. That hurt people hurt people. So what's interesting is what you got was a series of, text that told the truth behind why he was so sensitive. Mm -hmm. But of course, he's not going to bring that up front. And we don't know what's the experience of somebody else. Oh, he brought it so, up. He, he, that was why I said no. Okay. He brought up a lot of his, his pain and his dysfunction. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this isn't going to work for me. Yeah. And I didn't say, you know, you're, you're too wounded. You, you know, you obviously have some psychological issues you need to go have to get some help for. <laughs> it's not my business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's just knowing, like, this is not going to work. And, um, but I, I, like, I like what you said about um, starting with kindness, you know, and I, I, I agree with you. You know, we talk about the appreciation sandwich and, you know, appreciate first and at the end. And thank you so much for connecting, for your time, for whatever. It's going to be a no most of the time. I think what people don't realize is dating is a lot of no's. It's, it's not going to be a thousand yeses. By definition. Looking, Right. You're looking for one yes. That's it. I mean, one great yes is, is worth the whole process, but it's, well, yeah. that's what makes it hard. And the other thing to remember is if that person goes on a rant on you, hello, they just validated your choice. Yeah. Thank you. This isn't a bad thing. This is like, fool, I got that one right. Yeah. And so imagine. instead of feeding yourself of, I always pick the wrong guys, I don't trust my picker. What do you mean? You're a rock star. <laughs> They may have been the wrong guy, but as soon as you found out, you cleared that up. And he yeah. just validated, yeah, you dodged a major bullet here. Awesome. Yeah. Victory. Yeah. That's, that's right. And I think, you know, just to, you didn't go on a date with that person. You didn't, you didn't spend a lot of time because our time and energy is so precious and we need to preserve it. So, yeah. And, I, and you know, what you said before about telling the truth. It's such a hard thing for people. 
it's interesting that our our woman of value step today was about communicating clearly and graciously that happened to be completely by accident so mm -hmm. so to speak but it's it's really the theme of so much of what we're talking about here today and i see so many women who say i'm dating someone else or you know i, I have work is too busy none of that is true and when you do that you're not giving a person the closure that they need to say okay it is never going to work don't contact me again we are done i'm moving on and it's so hard for people to do that well so and a hard. simple way to do it is just you know even in your own head thanks but no thanks yeah just like if somebody offers you a drink and you don't want you don't go well maybe later if i get done with <laughs> work we do sometimes right we try and oh, yeah. soften it but what if you just said thanks but no thanks that's very mm -hmm. kind very generous, very honest, and you're done. Yeah. Because when we get all those calls back and why is he still calling me, that's not his fault. You left the door open because you were afraid to hurt his feelings. Well, whose feelings are getting hurt now? You're feeling not valued, you're feeling like all men, and it's feeding all your worst fears about men and making it harder and harder and harder to be open when you go out and date. Yeah. He'll probably be like that last guy. He'll probably be like <laughs> that last guy, right? Yeah. So we've got to take ownership. And that's, it's one of the things that, that I'm glad this came around because one of the things, like if we use that rose analogy, right? What grows in a garden besides the plants that you plant? Weeds. Lots of weeds. If you're not tending to the weeds, they will outstrip and outgrow whatever you planted every time. Weeds always grow faster. So if you keep feeding the weeds, by setting him up to keep calling you when you don't want him to and doing these kind of things that are hinting instead of being straight up and honest with him, guess what? You're feeding the weeds and they are going to grow up and they're going to overwhelm your flowers and you will give up on growing that garden at all. So you've got to manage the weeds. And the best way to do it is quit watering them. Just water what you want. Water the rose and guess what? The weeds will die. If they don't get enough water, they're going to die. But we just water everything. Oh, it's okay, my rose will grow. I'll just water the whole garden. Here's all the weeds. And remember, just like a garden, you didn't plant the weeds. They're there already. It's called your fears. They're already out there. They're getting fed by everybody else in the world. You gotta not water them. Because if you don't water them, they don't grow. Fantastic. <laughs> It's so easy to see when you use these these metaphors, and I, it, it reminds me of the parable of the wolves um, living mm -hmm. inside you, and who who you feed is the one that that will grow. Yeah. And it's I don't think people realize how much control they have over their thoughts, over their beliefs, over their fears, mm -hmm. because the fears are are really made up in your mind, and yeah. you can replace them with other thoughts that are more positive, more healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, so this has just been a fantastic conversation. I know that that it will inspire so many. And Ken, what what are your final words of advice for a woman who wants to go on her last first date? Date safer. <laughs> Bring the joy. Have a good time. From a man's perspective, again, if it's nice, it's never going to go anywhere. And if you're managing to make sure it's nice, so nothing was too out of sorts, and it's safe. It'll die, no matter how amazing you are, because he won't know. He'll think, well, there's lots of nice people. I'm looking for something special, the same way you are. So bring your special. Bring that rose. Be yourself. Let him know if you don't like where they're going to sit, all those kind of things. And guaranteed, he'll be like, wow, this woman's interesting. Because nobody else is doing it. Everybody else is playing it safe. And the guy who can't handle that isn't your guy. So it's not like you're, oh, I don't want to ruin the one. By definition, you can't ruin the one. If he's the one, there's nothing that can mess it up. That's what makes him the one. So bring you. That's how you're going to find him, because you'll be like, wow. I had a woman I was working with that she went on this date with this guy. And like, I don't know, a couple of years prior. And it didn't go well. And anyhow, he had seen her online again a couple of years later and said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to give it another shot. Da, 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 da. Would you like to be, go out? So they decided they would. She goes, Ken, I walked in there. We were having a drink at the bar. The place was busy. They said, can we sit here? And 
I said, sure, even though I totally didn't want to sit at the bar. Like, she abandoned everything she needed to be there. And luckily for her, by the end of the day, she realized it. And she went, hey, I just got to be honest. I've been distracted. I don't like sitting at the bar. And I agreed that I shouldn't have. And she just owned every piece of it. And she's like, it was amazing. Because he was like, wow, that's such a great gift. Like, you're interesting now. Before you were, yeah, nice lady, pretty, fun. But it wasn't. But now it's like, there's something here. So don't be afraid of you. Because that's what you want them to love anyhow. I love that. Yeah, it's, it's the hardest thing we do is to be ourselves. And it's the most important. And it's just having the courage to take off all the masks and all the, all the niceties. And I have a friend who's, who's in business who's doing this in her business where she's just trying to be nice. And I said, you know, you're not standing out because you're trying to be so nice to people that you're not really expressing who you are. And I said to her, I guarantee you that as soon as you let it all out, you're going to attract the right clients. So it's, it, it works everywhere in our lives. We have to really tap into what makes us special. And if anybody's watching this on video, what makes you a superhero? <laughs> I can, <laughs> if you can see all the superhero stuff in the background here. Uh, so Ken, thank you so much. Tell us, tell us how people can find you and whether you have something you want to give away to our audience. Now yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so you can find me either at my website, which is kenbechtel.com, and there's actually a free training there called Blossom Into Love that you can check out, which will definitely go deeper into what we've been talking about. Um, the other place is I've got a Facebook group that's called Professional Women Finding Success in Love. And it's really, there's tons of stuff I do on there, Facebook Lives and all kinds of stuff to help you get past all these stories and myths that you've been fed your whole life that keep you confined because everybody else is validating them. All your friends are going, oh yeah, yeah, that's how, yeah, yeah. And you know in your heart that's not true. But again, nobody ever trained you on how to be a partner. They just said, hey, you're supposed to go meet somebody. Bye-bye, good luck. And we went out there and we bumbled around and we kind of looked at what our parents do and what are our friends doing and they didn't seem to do anything and they met an amazing guy so that didn't help and you don't have any guidance so that's what i do that's what i mean when i'm a love mentor when i'm mentoring somebody it's not about me telling you what to do what mentors do is mentors actually help you bring out the pieces of you you didn't know were there that's a mentor and that's what i do wonderful well, thank you again. This has been another enlightening conversation with Ken. And I will also post a link to our other show in the show notes. And um, just keep doing this wonderful, fantastic work that you're doing. Thanks, Ken. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening today. If you love our show, please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And we hope you go on your last first date very soon. Bye.